And what's okay, so difficult? Now you mentioned Rameau, and that that is a great uh, step. <laughs> now we, that's that's interesting because you wrote a book called Rameau's Long Shadow: Studies on German Music Theory of the 18th Century, and you released that in 2017. Let's talk about Jean Philippe Rameau, a hugely influential music theorist. Do people, uh, do they understand his theories correctly? Is he being misinterpreted? No, I, I think we all know that he was nearly never really understood. I mean, that was even uh, in his times, even you could see that's what, what uh, Thomas Christensen said in, in years ago in his really fundamental studies. He was never really understood. That's true. He was at least, what is so funny about it, if you ask myself, of course, this is a very personal uh, kind of evaluation, but at least if you see that even the mostly even in the French reception, he is misunderstood and by quite a lot of reasons. But um, he was, I think, one of the the, the most prolific and most uh, educated readers of Rameau's theory. Certainly, was Marpok. And he was really someone who quite un- understood a lot of these things, but at least he was not sharing the ideals of Rameau. So uh, the way he put Rameau into German reception, that's what my book is about, no, well, it's one part of the what this book is about, was really had a certain, let's say, political music theoretical function. So he was uh, functionalizing Rameau for his own purposes, but his own, but his own theory was n- not really understood. But it's extremely difficult to understand. I mean, we still have to say. What, <laughs> what, what are people getting wrong? So, is there not a fundamental base in accord? Well, there are some of the very well well known things that I, I I think they're really not not they're very, really difficult. First of all, I would say people are very much concentrating on his first book on Entrée de la Monie. But you have to say that beginning even from the Nouveau Traité de la Monie, but at least with beginning with the dissertation, um, the late or the, the, the major music theory of Rameau is quite different from these from his beginnings in the Traité de la oh, Monie. Wow. <laughs> uh, and that, that, certainly, that certainly makes it quite difficult. Um, that's perhaps one thing uh, we have to see. And I think we can quite agree, quite a lot of, of, of scholars agreeing perhaps on this. Um, then I would say um, one point of the reception, which is very different in the different countries, is that you can see that for the music theorists and the musicians of the time, the most important books of Rameau were books three and four. I mean, all these books where he's really treating, telling about uh, the Regola de Lotava, about the, the uh, uh, La Suite des Septième. I mean, about uh, these uh, playing of the, uh, oh, let's say the practical part, the, the, the composition, the practical part of his theory. But the German reception very much, and it's still true, I would say, for the, for the French reception, is very much concentrated on book one and two about a generation. But there's a certain point in the Traité de la Munie and later on in, 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 in later writings where Ramon really says, well, you see, these questions about the generation, des accords, generation, etc., et they are not really relevant for what we do in practical uh, music. Oh my and goodness! What, does he really say that? Oh my he God. does. Wow. He does, he, well, but, but 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 look, he comes from a music theoretical um, tradition, writing in books, well, like uh, Salino, like others, where these uh, parts are very much separated. I mean, this is, I mean, you have to see this separation. So, for example, vous voyez, je remonte en français. I'm falling into French when I'm talking about it. But look, if, if, if he's really going, for example, into, into the, the generation, in the generation of the sound, where does it come from? Where's our tonal system coming from, etc.? He's talking about uh, les sons fondamentaux, which is bringing up a, a, a generation uh, the only thing we, we all know uh, there are there is the tonic and the tonic is creating the dominant and the subdominant and then we have the scale etc cetera, etc cetera. but this certainly is not what the marche fundamental uh, for the practical music is about these are two i would say these are completely different things and 
in re, not only in reception but in the whole music theory this question of of uh, fifth progression of what the cause of degeneration are these questions i would say these historical question of what people are dealing with in the first volume they took over and they were brought in some sense into in, into the uh, practical uh, in, into the practi- into the practical part but for Rameau, these things are quite separate this is this is generation this is regle de l'octave uh, uh, a counterpoint uh, this is uh, uh, les faces uh, alors uh, the the um what we call the 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 um la mécanique des doigts the mechanic of of the of the fingers so the haptical part which he is pro but these are two different parts and every part has if you can see a very explicit a very special notion of chord the haptic chord is different from the trias harmonica chord which stems in some sense from from the generation um, very different from the, the 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 notion of chord in the regola de l'ottava very interesting now, figure that you've covered is jean-philippe rameau and you've done some stellar work researching him and he is a very influential figure in music theory, music history. Let's talk about him and I guess the general almost cartoon image of him is he's the fundamental bass guy and so everything he thinks about so if we think of music there's a fundamental chord behind everything um, but he is much more complex than that. He's also very practical. How should we approach Rameau and how should we consider him with a little bit more nuance? I think the reason I got interested in Rameau when I was in graduate school, I mean, this became basically the focus of my dissertation and my first book and work in in, uh, historical music theory was um, because he seemed like such a cartoon character that I was reading uh, in in what I was reading. And and much of that reading came from some of the Schenkerian literature that I was reading where Schenker famously put – opposed Rameau to Beethoven and said, you know, we have a crisis in our music, you know, culture at this time. And is it going to be Beethoven or is it going to be Rameau? And I thought that was, a was that had to be a specious opposition between the two of them. And as I dug a little bit into that, um, I think that's one way I started getting interested in historical theory, because I began to realize, well, Rameau was a much more complex and interesting and sophisticated writer than this caricature suggests. It wasn't just you know, stacking thirds up and getting chords and assigning them a root, and that was about it. Um, at the same time, I also wondered why would Schenker say something like that, and that made me curious to know more about um, where some of his – his very strong nationalist rhetoric and ideologies came from too. So in from sort of both sides, I began to kind of want to sort of peek behind the curtain and see what was going on with, with, with these kinds of arguments. He is an 18th century figure in music. And so would he have shared in the thorough base uh, thought process of musica practica and practical thinking and when he is composing music because he was really uh, admired as a composer did he compose thinking with his theories in the sense that uh, this cartoon image we have and ah, i'm going from this chord to this chord and the bass line is is subservient to the actual fundamental chord here or are these two separate things is this a scientific side to his thought and then he had a separate practical side um, well, that's a uh, that's a really important question, and that's one that I've I, I have had to explore quite a bit in my um, in some of my work. Um, I think I've always I've ended up always seeing it as a kind of dialectic that they both, you know, they're both sides of his both his personality as well as as his intellectual thought. Um, no, I don't think he you know simply thought okay I'm going to put down you know. He, he thought about his his theory as as a as a, a means and method of composition, um, even though he actually at certain points suggested it could be. But um, I think his his mind was trained. Um, you know, he, he he understood music kind of instinctively, and uh, what what the, what his theory supposedly elucidates is a kind of maybe subconscious. Um, 
operation of the musician's mind. That is to say, you know, the reality of co- chords and harmonies that have roots and that the roots connect, um, you know, by, you know, intelligible rules uh, to one another. And um, but that this is not something one sort of consciously says, OK, my next chord has to connect by some kind of fifth chord, um, you know, by, by a, a, a perfect fifth or a fourth um, in order to follow this theory, something like that. That would that would have been, you know, much too mechanical. And he um, he, he certainly would not have ever, ever accepted that. There's a point to Thoroughbase where, OK, if you're not going to think of fundamental chords, then you have to th- learn maybe hundreds of different chords over a particular bass. And the thinking is, oh, if I have a fundamental chord, it simplifies it down to, what was it, two chords that Rameau said there's only really two chords? And then maybe he had the subdominant chord later. Is that maybe aimed at at an easier way to learn music rather than the the hundreds of chords that thorough bass might yield to a beginning student? Right. That was, um, yeah, that was a kind of um, sort of a pedagogical uh, heuristic that, um, you know, could help a student maybe understand the morass of chords, the chord figures, um, that there, you know, there's ways of sort of reducing these to a couple of fundamental types. And that was, um, that was sort of the, um, the hook about um, chordal inversion and you know one reason it became very popular is that it 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 gave a sort of a very simple way of understanding and relating certain figures to one another so that you know the triad was you know um similar to a six three and a six four chord um you know if you just uh inverted them in, in, in different ways. Um, right. And that certainly became a kind of a, a sort of a useful tool for, you know, basic um, performance or teaching and, and, and learning to realize the, uh, the, the thorough base. But um, I think it's based, it's basically that it's a kind of a introductory way to understand how these chords relate and and to learn the realization. But pretty quickly, um, any good keyboardist um, doesn't spend that much of time thinking that every time you come to a 6-3 chord saying, ah, you know, this is a first inversion of this triad here. I think you're just... You 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 have other things to be thinking about and work and well, one paying thing I've noticed to. is if you do think of that fundamental chord way, you do have to add an extra layer of of thought that slows you down a little bit. Uh, whereas if you if you thought just mm-hmm. strictly from the base, it you it is faster because you remove one extra thought process. Yeah, exactly. And so I think um, you do have to disentangle the 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 practical side of his theory if you will from the more the more deep deeper intellectual substrata which um was extremely important to him and uh, but it was not necessarily something you had to um if you will bring to the fore of your consciousness if you're playing music or even writing music for that matter and it's not Without reason, one of his last writings uh, that he uh, that he published in his lifetime was an essay that was called um, uh, "Our Instinct for Music." That's sort of the basic English translation of it, and uh, it was a very much um, about the ways that um, you know, musicians um, might operate, sort of with this kind of subconscious instinct about. The fundamental base, um, but it's not something that you know. It, it's it's one that you're always aware of at the time. Now, could you speak on his practicality as a pedagogue? Because I, I I feel a lot of people think of him as a theorist, but he is quite a significant practical musician. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, that's one of a a point I kind of try to hammer home in, uh, yeah. <laughs> in in my book about him is that he's very much sort of a you know has a uh, is 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 both a theorist and a practicing musician and all you have to do is look at his very first big treatise the uh, on harmony the traité de l'harmonie and um, the first two books are if you will speculative theoretical on chords and the fundamental base and then the last two books are practical ones on thorough base and then on composition um, it's uh, you know it's it's modeled on that 
that distinction of practica and teorica that you know goes back to uh, Zarlino and uh, even earlier to uh, you know, Gaforio and Ramos and uh, into the Middle Ages. A constant conversation I've noticed is this question of chord invertibility. And again, that it's, it's a term that, that could mean different things to different people. Why was CPE Bach hostile to Rameau and Kernberger as well, even though Kernberger seemed to have adopted some of Rameau's uh, thinking? Well, those are... Yeah, those are interesting questions too that I've uh, that I've uh, I was always fascinated by as as well um, because you're right that uh, someone like Kernberger turns out to have been offered I think one of the most uh, one of the most elaborate and um, and in some ways uh, pedagogically effective. Uh, ways of learning Rameau's theory of the fundamental base, even though he never once mentioned his name to him. And um, I think the answer to your question goes back to um, where we began, that um, is, it's the politics of, uh, of music theory. Um, it's, uh, it, it never has been and still is not just a dispassionate intellectual exercise. There can be different opinions and polemics and arguments, and sometimes they don't always have um, have anything to do or uh, not completely um, on just very um, – you know, scientific questions of testing and verifying some statement or uh, or a rule that um, a theorist deduces. Um, they can often be based on petty jealousies and um, and rivalries, and um, and that's the case I think with uh, in uh, with uh, Rameau's reception in Germany. That there was uh, you have to put it in the context of um, of kind of polemics between French music and um, and its recept and the way that it was um, received in Germany at the time um, and um, that, that's likewise I think part of the ways that Schenker was looking at it too was a, it was sort of this innate prejudice against um, almost anything French um, and that would have included something like Rameau too. This question of court invertibility, did it originate with Rameau or can we see it in the history of music theory go even earlier than him? And, and where do, you, do we see the earliest conceptions of chordal invertibility? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, a number of scholars have looked into this question, and um, it, um, it it seems like it's been almost a little competition. Who can find the earliest citations of some of these of, of uh, you know triadic invertibility? Just as there's a little other uh, Olympic uh, contest for where is the first <laughs> chord root that's been identified, or where is there the first Rome, who used Roman numerals for yes. the very first time, and so forth. Um, all of these have deep roots in the 17th century um, and you know possibly even earlier um, it, it, it depending on how you read the evidence but I mean chord inversion certainly comes goes back to the early 17th century where um, theoretically you had some um, writers in in, in Germany um, who were analyzing the the triad um, where you know parts of this came up um, as, as 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 a discussion, um, and uh, you also find it in some very practical ways of some of the uh, uh, continuo um, pedagogies at the time, where um, as you mentioned earlier, there um, the the keyboardist the, the these these uh, figures were often taught as very simple. You know, kind of transpositions of one another, six three, six four from the five three. But there was no theoretical um, argument about that. It was just simply, hey, if you want a really simple way of um, playing, um, you know, understanding the six three chord, just imagine the third below it, and think of the triad on that, and that's what you play with your right hand. And you know, it's as simple as that. And that you find in you find throughout the seventeenth century. C.B.E. Bach mentioned that there was a lot of new harmonies cropping up at the time of his writing. And is it just a consequence of the age that perhaps fundamental chord theory is 
useful to because already we have so many different chords uh, now we have even more interesting harmonies cropping up perhaps we need to have a system to categorize all these harmonies and thus fundamental bass theory is more useful to categorize all these new chords and new harmonies yeah i don't I mean, fundamental bass is not um you know or maybe more accurately the you know Rameau's theory of chord generation is is not very uh, successful in accounting for a lot of the um, you know the more dissonant harmonies that were being uh, tested by composers in the uh, in especially later in the 18th century. But even for that matter, for uh, you know some of the figures that J. S. Bach would have uh, used in um, in some of his writings, um, you know that's always been one of the um, one of the the I guess the difficulties of of, of using very strict you know uh, Ramoian you know chord theory or or for that matter Roman numeral theory is that it's just um, it's it it can't accommodate um, in any strictly generative way these harmonies you have to take into account counterpoint and you know and most of those would end up being very difficult and complex harmonies you know usually um, are better understood as um, you know various counterpuntal voices that are moving above the harmony and you know maybe at a given verticality be caught in a harmony but um, you know can't really be understood as sort of organically resulting from some kind of generative source um, it's 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 the play of counterpoint and that's where you know figured bass is a much more uh, if you will, you know, accurate notation for uh, for for capturing this than is uh, than is uh, than than our Roman numerals. Did Rameau speak of counterpoint in his theoretical treatises? Of course he did. I don't can I cannot imagine any uh, you know any. Uh, well, that's not true. I was going to say I can't imagine any theorist who deals with harmony who can't who doesn't also mention counterpoint. But uh, yeah, I suppose I suppose there are those there are. S- some exceptions to that, but um, in any case, yes, Rameau, um, you know, had sections on counterpoint in some of his, in in, in many of his writings. Um, you know, admittedly, he didn't develop it the way you know, in, in uh, the way that you know, maybe those who were exploring you know species counterpoint through through you know the writings of Fuchs or such. Um, might have approached counterpoint, but um, you know, even for something um, as simple as a um, his uh, his so-called chords of supposition, which were the ways he tried to at one point account for uh, suspension chords like four three, he um, he at um, at different points in his his career and writings would say, well, you can also just think of this as a delay of the, uh, of the third, the, a, a note is being suspended over into the next chord. And, and that, um, is, uh, not part of the original core of, of the, uh, fundamental base. It's just a, uh, it's a delay, um, of, a, of, of a resolution. And, uh, likewise, he, uh, at various points interpreted the six, four chord, you know, alternatively as an inversion of a triad or as a suspension, um, especially in cadential points to a, uh, a double suspension to a triad. So, um, I think Rumbo was was he was too good of a musician not to understand that you know counterpoint and voice leading played a role in 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 harmony. Let's turn to the rule of the octave, and I noticed that you write that that's something that he analyzed quite seriously. The rule of the octave and and trying to apply his theories and reconciling his mm-hmm. theories to the rule of the octave. Yeah, he did. The well, there was a um, I mean an obvious reason for that that was one of uh, the f- the fundamental exercises and models of uh, thorough bass pedagogy um, and you find it you know in in the partimenti school you know is one of the very first exercises um, every student needs to learn it's just a, what is the uh, normative harmonization of the uh, major and minor scales in the bass and um, and so being such a central part of thorough bass uh, training, um, I think Rameau felt it 
if you will, almost an obligation to try to show, in fact, that its its theoretical origin, if you will, its uh, for understanding it and why it works as it does, um, th- th- that it's a uh, there's a theoretical explanation that you can uh, he could pose using his his own theory of the of the uh, Bas Fundamental, and um, but it didn't quite work out because there are ways that it didn't it doesn't doesn't fit precisely with some of his more orthodox um, prescriptions about the thorough base. And so it became a kind of an irritant in his writings. And it's something he returned to, you know, many, many times and couldn't quite make it work. Um, But he became, he was very creative in, you know, in, in testing different solutions to that. Is that connecting the sixth chord to the seventh chord? The sixth scale degree to the seventh scale degree. Yeah, ascending. Um, yeah, that's one of the places where there, there would often be a um, uh, a, a, a disjunct um, because that would require um, would require a subdominant chord moving to a, a, a dominant chord, and according to his um, his, his his original theory, uh, you shouldn't have, uh, you shouldn't generally have a um, a motion by a second um, in the fundamental base. You know, it's better to interpret the um, the uh, the for the what we would call the subdominant in that case as a kind of inverted uh, supertonic chord, the chord on two, and so that became. Um, that became one of the knots, if you will, in his uh, that that he couldn't quite untangle in his uh, his arguments about the uh, the rule of the octave. Very interesting. Uh, could you just speak on his influence in Italy and even in for the Neapolitans by the turn of the nineteenth century, they had adopted fundamental base theory. Some of them did, not all of them, um, but yes, it it uh, it's. Uh, you know, and you could say that about um, you know, almost every uh, every musical uh, you know uh, center in Europe by the beginning of the 19th century. I mean, some version of uh, of, of chordal theory, um, maybe not specifically the fundamental base, but certainly you know the 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 derivatives of that, which is the uh, Roman numeral Stufen theory, um, certainly became widespread um, and almost ubiquitous not not completely um, there were still very resilient pockets of um, I think sort of the more Italian influenced partimenti schools that continued to be taught but um, it was certainly um, I think in a, in, a, in the more popular you know market of uh, of uh, Harmony pedagogy and um, composition manuals that were published. Um, the, uh, the 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 triadic approach, the the Roman numeral and fundamental base was was predominant. Is the appeal of of Rameau's theories because it's more scientific and and more uh, of a higher order of thought compared to something like counterpoint, which is not considered not as scientific around that time? Well, if you're talking about the like the turn into the 19th century, yes, um, yes. I would say that Rameau's fundamental base really was receding. Um, there was a famous moment in uh, with the founding of the uh, Paris Conservatory in uh, at the very beginning of the 19th century, where um, it was decided that they were no longer going to teach the fundamental base and instead adopted a uh, um, a manual by another professor of composition there named Cattell, um, which had you know no fundamental base in it whatsoever, um, with the exception of um, a kind of idiosyncratic school in Vienna uh, with Simon Sector. There was really very few. Uh, theorists in the 19th century who taught anything that looked like the fundamental base. So that part of Rameau's um, 
theory, I think, sort of def- definitely receded into the background. Um, but what you had in its place, of course, was the uh, Roman numeral uh, Stufen theory of of uh, of uh, writers such as uh, Weber in, in Germany um, and Yelpensberger in, in France, which were, um, if you will, the next generation of Rameau's uh, theory, but it was uh, one that did not um, emphasize so much the kind of chord by chord syntax that Rameau was focused on with his fundamental base, um, and it it um, it became dominant in Europe partly because it was just it was very simple. I mean, it became a um, a uh, it, it had a very it had a practical value for you know learning basic harmonies and. Um, and understanding, you know, how certain chords or chord patterns uh, functioned, and uh, it it um, it's one reason why, you know, to this day it is still a dominant, and I I'm still tempted to say the dominant way that tonal harmony is uh, taught and understood by most uh, most musicians.